Okay. I think I think we're live. I'm sure chat will let me know. Hope everyone Looks had like a nice me, weekend. Yeah. As you can tell, unusual Monday session, the duck has decided one show a week isn't enough. He needs to encroach on this one as well to <laughs> offer his opinion. He's always welcome, so he's here. What's up? That, that's awfully wrong, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you invited me, and I was like, I mean, we haven't done this in a while, right? Casual Friday kind of didn't happen, so... Yeah, true, true. Um, so, yeah, I'm just gonna, we're going to talk shop. Before that, download the Blockfolio mobile app, the sponsor of Technical Roundup. Why? Because there are certain points at which cryptocurrencies go up in price, sometimes for several days and weeks in a row. Um, sometimes altcoins do so as well, and it's a sector that sometimes prints green candles alongside red ones. Uh, and it's a good market to trade when it looks like that. So you've got to be positioned to take advantage of those seemingly rare circumstances. And the best way to onboard noobs into crypto in our humble and conflicted commercially view is via Blockfolio. So get it and spread the shitcoin addiction to people that you claim to care about. That's definitely my approach anyway. Um, that yeah, said, I mean, I've got like a decent friendship track record. Like it's mostly just Bitcoin and ETH and I just chill high time frame bottoms, although it's kind of full retraced already. What about you? <laughs> no, I mean, if you if you if you're suffering, why not make everyone around you suffer too, right? Yeah, <laughs> get that, them into the totally shit coins. Um, but no, I, I mean, I generally tend to try to avoid telling friends about it um, because I mean, for some reason, they only listen when I'm wrong, <laughs> and oh, and then just like do dumb shit on top of it. So I try to avoid it, but. It's fair enough. Uh, yeah, I've got pretty much one friend to whom I shill entries. Um, he's probably outperformed me anyway, so <laughs> no, n nothing lost. Okay, so um, I've got a couple of topics news-wise to discuss. Uh, I'd love your input if you have anything cool or not cool to say, uh, and we'll kind of just roll through them and then see see where the wind takes us. Um, lick for you says same time as SZ. Yes. Um, by the miracle of live stream technology, you can watch whichever stream you want and then replay the other one, or maybe even watch them at the same time. All, all down to you. But I'm sure there's some very useful trading-related stuff going on there, so go check out SZ's videos as well. Um, but this has been our slot for whatever, like, the longest time now, so we're not going to move about because of conflict. So It feels like a year already. Yeah, it's, it's a long time. Um, okay. First things first. We'll start with actually, you know what? We'll do micro strategy as a second or third one. Um, first of all, we're gonna kind of go back in time and talk about El Salvador again. So ordinarily, when something is legal tender, especially in like Europe, in the West, whatever, um, that doesn't force businesses and private individuals, merchants, whatever, to accept that specific legal tender for payments. Um, ordinarily, legal tender just means in order to is extinguish a certain debt, that currency or mode of payment is officially legalized, sorry, recognized by the legal system, okay? Which is why there was a lot of reasonable speculation initially that, yeah, it's going to be legal tender in El Salvador, but that doesn't necessarily mean that merchants have to accept it as payment because you want to give them the freedom to choose and ordinarily in other places and other countries um, there's no threat of force or enforcement by law that you need to accept a certain payment method. So I was already made uncomfortable by the fact that people were warming up and cozying up to the head of El Salvador to the extent that they have. Um, his like I, I understand the significance of the legislation for Bitcoin that doesn't mean we have to cozy up to people with questionable human rights records. Uh, a bit of a shaky, to say the least, understanding of the separation of powers and just really, really not the best people, uh, in my opinion, um, when it comes to governing, right? 
And of course, one part of the Bitcoin law which made me uncomfortable uh, was that unlike in most cases of something becoming legal tender, um, it actually, you're by law, you will have to accept Bitcoin as payment if you are a merchant or whatever in El Salvador. So you've got Jerry Brito here, the executive director of Coin Center, um, had a nice little thread saying El Salvador's Bitcoin law is a disgrace. As written in statute, it forces citizens to accept Bitcoins whether they want to or not. This is intuitively wrong to any liberal. Uh, and that is a pretty uncontroversial and unsurprising position. At least it should be. Um, but it seems to be something most people just glossed over because, hey, adoption, Bitcoin country, orange coin good. The guy hangs out on Twitter spaces, so he's one of it. It's just this weird... Um, weird cozying up cope whatever which i found super uncomfortable and unpersuasive and he's correct in saying disappointing that in response to criticism defenders of this law have resorted to what about isms and moral equivalents i i totally agree it's it's been a bit of a it's quite embarrassing and a bit of a shit show uh, in that regard and ironically if you, if you kind of look at a definition of what fiat currency is obviously it, there are a few and there are different properties but one of them is um, money by decree, right? It's it's money because the government says it's money. And ironically, some version of that is what's happening to Bitcoin in El Salvador. And I, I say ironically because it's the most illiberal thing you can do is, hey, Bitcoin's going to be money because we're going to, by the threat of the law, or in, by the implicit use of force, um, going to make it money, which is just shitty, lazy, and quite... Uh, it stands in juxtaposition to what I think Bitcoin is to most people, and nobody seems to give a shit. So, I mean, whatever. Um, I just wanted to bring that up because sometimes we do things, you know, it's like everyone sees E tweeted, have you said thanks to President Xi for like Bitcoin or whatever? Like, it just seems from time to time, if we think there's a decent chance that Orange Coin go up, uh, we kind of just throw our morals out the window and become hypocrites as long as it might have or might yield some kind of positive outcome. In this case, it's just kind of embarrassing and almost directly antithetical uh, to what Bitcoin is and to what freedom is, both in terms of uh, the, the head of state and also the the way the law um, is enforced, enacted, whatever. I don't know if you think anything of this, Duck, but it's just one of those um, sour taste in my mouth type of things. No, I agree. I mean, it, it kind of feels like they found someone that was relatively easy to get on board and uh, then just ran with it. But yeah, I'm not a big fan either. I mean, I'm not saying like it's bad that this is happening. I'm just saying like as in like that it's getting adopted somewhere. I'm just saying like the means and kind of where it's getting adopted is a little bit odd to me as well. But yeah, yeah. I was I think actually defending the news to some extent, saying like, look, you've got to start somewhere when it comes to these countries being Bitcoinized or whatever, as you can't expect it to be like in, in Central Europe or something. It's probably not where it's going to start. Uh, but that doesn't mean we have to throw the moral baby out with the bathwater or whatever the broken idiom is uh, and yes. making like like forcing something to be money by law is just a, ironically a super like anti-freedom fiat currency thing while that thing is actually bitcoin in this context it just seems totally inappropriate you know I, I totally agree i mean the thing is like the feeling that i've gotten over the last few years is that like what bitcoin actually stands for has gotten less and less important and the price has gotten more and more important to people right um because i mean we see a bunch of stuff where you should start thinking okay is this really what we've been kind of rooting for what what this space should be moving towards and it's always just now fuck it if it increases the price it's good and if it <laughs> decreases the price it's bad and that couldn't be further from the truth i mean i've said this about sailor before that i'm not the biggest fan of him and his company holding so much bitcoin and i've gotten a lot of negative um criticism for it because people are just like if you're hating him you hate bitcoin and it's not the case right it's just like i don't think it's necessarily the best thing for the space. I'm not saying it shouldn't be allowed or something. I'm just saying, like, I don't think it's the best thing to happen. Um, but people just tend to think, okay, if price goes up, good. If price goes down, bad. Um, yep. Yeah. Yep. 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 
so that's just something to have on our radar. Um, you know, even the libertarians are like, I favor removing all legal tender laws, but hard to argue this isn't a net step forward given the economic opportunities. It's like, maybe, maybe, it remains to be seen. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to bring that up because it's just been on my radar and it's it's been annoying. And we, ju we just suck up to some pretty rough causes if we think it can make orange coin go up and sometimes it just gets a bit too <laughs> ironic not to point out, right? Um, okay, another bit of news, and this is to some extent price action related, but China bans Bitcoin again to some extent. Uh, I, would, I will say that the block has... Um, Wolfie Zhao, I probably butchered his name completely, um, but he's he's really good at the nuance when it comes to news from China. So I really like reading his articles. Um, PBOC orders Chinese banks to cut off accounts of crypto OTC merchants, reiterating 2017 ban. Um, he does say there's a bit of a um, distinction. So at one point he says exactly what that is. Right, uh, he says, although Chinese various Chinese banks have sent out similar notices, before since 2013 the exact wordings in the monday statement are different in a nuanced way in all previous notices chinese banks said if a customer was found with using their banks to make crypto transactions the banks would retain the right crucially retain the right to close down their accounts implying they may not may not necessarily do so whereas we can see from the most more recent wording it says the institutions should immediately cut off their payment and funding channels so arguably some stronger wording and i think the second point is really more important uh, this seems to be like phase two or phase three, depending on how you count, uh, of a wiser, wiser, wider crackdown on crypto. So we had step one with mining, step two with derivative slash leverage, uh, and now, you know, step slash phase three is a pretty harsh banking slash general service provider crackdown on Bitcoin trading as well as mining. Um, I listened to Suzu and Hasu talk about China on Uncommon Core. That was a really good podcast episode, and I've got the notes on there somewhere on my Twitter. And Su was saying how a lot of the time it's like China FUD is what makes it extra bearish is that you don't know like when it's going to end, right? It's always very nice when you have FUD that's finite. Like you know who's selling and what the news is and how much, and you get some sort of framework for like the extent of bearishness, right? If you know it's going to come to an end or there's some sort of natural conclusion to it, then you can kind of, it, it's easier to price in some shitty news. But if you've got something like this, which seems to be a broader crackdown and comes in multiple phases, and there's also like a huge information asymmetry between East and West, it just makes it pretty tricky um, from a from a trading point of view to really know where the, where the floor is on the bad news. Um, what do you think? Did you kind of agree that this seems to be a wider thing? Uh, do you think it's over? What are your impressions of the China bans Bitcoin thing? I mean, we've had it before, but yeah, I agree. It sounds more serious this time around. Um, but I, I agree with you that it's really hard to, to kind of judge just based on the information asymmetry that, that is there. Because, I mean, you, you kind of have to understand everything about China and how it operates to kind of understand like how far reaching this is. And I just don't, right? So I'm just sitting here being like, okay, uh, it sounds pretty serious. I have no idea if it really is like super, super serious. So I tend to just listen to people that are actually from that area and kind of deal with, with the Chinese government. Yeah. And um, I mean, the block seems to make, be making a good case. So for like sure. that would be information that I'd be looking at and then ask Chinese friends about it. So far, I haven't done that yet because, I mean, this just seems like just an extra nail in the coffin, at least in the short term, rather than just, OK, this is the only thing that is driving Bitcoin price down. But uh, yeah, it's it's not easy to to kind of judge how far this can drive price down, if it's going to like get price down at all. Um, but it's kind of funny that do you remember the, the Xi candle that we had? Like the... Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The massive squeeze. I kind of have that as like an... I mean, you talked about it earlier. It being like pushing price up a shitload. And um, now we have kind of the opposite statement coming out, right? Uh, so China's always been... It, with regards to crypto, it has been like that. Where it's like 
it's getting like they're like okay we like cryptocurrencies and then they kind of go back on that and say okay it should be banned and it goes back and forth back and forth i wouldn't be surprised if that changes again um but it's definitely not good news in the short term yep agreed about the short term i think long term this is like actually bullish i know it sounds hilarious but this has kind of achieved two things one is it encourages the decentralization of hash rate right so the argument that you know oh bitcoin is just like china or china or chinese owners or chinese mining pools kind of own or slash control bitcoin because of the hash rate distribution that argument becomes far less compelling if there's this migration net migration out of china with regard to hash rate so that's long medium long term bullish and also we know a lot of the miners um, that shut down were not using renewables and were coal miners etc cetera, etc cetera. so to some extent the energy argument as well um catches a bit of a break um alongside that hash rate decentralization so it's, it's pretty decent um like mid to long term development especially with it when the market starts to recover, that's just kind of a bearish talking point that's not as compelling as it was previously. So I'm cool with that. But yeah, in the short term, just your your classic crackdown, regulatory uncertainty in a market that doesn't look super strong anyway. Um, so makes sense. But let's let's see how let's see how that plays out. So, but I agree. Short term sucks. Medium long term probably not bad. Um, but obviously we'll we'll see it from a positive lens. When the market starts going up and when the market's going down, <laughs> we'll kind of see it from a negative lens, right? That's yeah. sort of how the reflexivity works. Um, I also wanted to now bring up what's in the title, which is MicroStrategy. Um, Sailor raised, I think, $500 million. He's bought $489 million. Um, as we all know, Sailor just raises money to buy Bitcoin, and it seems the sophistication of his operation is raise money and then just pretty much start market buying. The average for his most recent purchase was at 37.6, so pretty much the range high slash resistance, whatever, not the best average in the world, uh, and it's already underwater to, to a, to a non-trivial extent. Uh, I think more pressingly is he's completely nuked his average. Um, you can. I remember reading like I don't know in the in the 20s or in the 30s he had like a low to mid teens average. Um, I'm sure. Look, someone I'm sure has the perfect numbers, but you know the sentiment I'm trying to get across, where it seemed like his entry getting retested was just a pipe dream, right? He was like in mm -hmm. full control, massive exposure, uh, and that's it. He he's just gonna ride into the sunset. Whereas now. Uh, it seems very possible that we actually come in and test his entry, uh, or at the very least, like a small fart in the market would would send it tumbling, uh, probably below where his entry point is anyway. If the if the thirty k uh, floor is to be broken, to some extent, I wanted to make the argument that oh well, that's how disappointing is that that you go from being the reason for the bull market, like from from being the bull market catalyst to being uh, potentially, you know, post bull market bag holder or someone who DCA'd way too shittily and is now underwater, etc., etc. Right? From like causing the bull market to bag holding it. But in hindsight, that's kind of the only logical conclusion, or it's like it's ultimately not that surprising given uh, his mandate and how he operates. Like he doesn't have a sell button really, right? We know from one of the more recent filings that they can and will uh, take profit and trade around their position, but but certainly for now, uh, he doesn't have a sell button uh he can only be he's been buying just all the bitcoin that he can and again the reflexivity works in his favor but then also against him as the bitcoin price goes up he makes more money it's super easy to raise more money and he can buy more bitcoin than he did previously um without a, a straightforward way to rebalance slash work around it so so maybe it's not that surprising that this is where he's ended up with like a really hefty average and also just a shit ton of bitcoin um but maybe i'm wrong what do you what do you think first of all is like was this inevitable that at some point in crypto given how he, it works and how sailor works that his average would you know start to become a bit dangerous i i think he just i i i think he's just way like in way over his head honestly like i think he's just he's 
really thinking that like the dollar is going to be worthless and that he needs to get out. I think like he truly believes the stuff that he's talking about. Um, so he's just like, okay, I need to hurry up with this. And I think he's just wrong on that. I don't think the USD is going to zero. So there's like no rush. And what he's doing basically is something I've been seeing in a lot of novice traders actually, where they start buying something and it goes up and then they buy more and then it goes up and then they might even introduce some leverage and then they, it goes up even more and then they buy even more of it and then it crashes and then they get fucked, right? And I'm not saying he's going to be that guy, but he's behaving exactly like one. And um, I mean, I'm pretty certain we're going to be trading below his average at some point. We're technically already trading below his average because if he tried to sell the 100 something Bitcoin, like 100,000 something Bitcoin that he has, we'd be trading lower than his entry, right? And um, like the longer this goes on and the more he buys, the worse his average is going to get. And um, I don't know, like I don't agree with how he's been buying it. Now, he's kind of backed by the US financial system, right? So like the stuff that people keep talking about with liquidating him could be further from the truth. It's just um, I don't really like what if this turns into like a couple year long bear market? I have no idea what he's going to do because he's going to have to pay some of the stuff back that he's borrowed. And um, I mean, maybe he shakes another trick out of his out of his sleeves, but I don't know. I, I find it. I think he's going a little bit overboard, even more so if he starts like buying even more now because he's already in pretty deep. And um, I was going to say, think... like, technically, he's not done, right? So he's got this five hundred million raise at which he's brought into the market but you'll recall that shortly after that was announced there was another um like he was basically going to sell shares up to one billion and use that to buy bitcoin as well yeah and um, i'm not sure how far along that process is or how it works structurally but at the very least we know that um a there's still an outstanding appetite for him to buy bitcoin B, there doesn't seem to be any difficulty with him raising money in any way. He, he, he's got a very uh, good understanding of market structure, capital structure, structured products, whatever, allowing him to raise money pretty is easily. And we know that the last raise he did was oversubscribed, right? So there's no shortage yeah. of people throwing money at him. Um, and I forgot what C is. But yeah, either way, he, he still wants to buy more uh, and... I don't think he'll run into any difficulties raising um, that amount of money. But then, of course, his average at that point, if he, you know, starts buying a billion or, you know, even in tranches of like a few hundred million, I don't know the exact process of how those uh, share offerings or selling shares works. Um, but, you know, in terms of his average at that point, he, he's working with a uh, 30K average, more or less, right? Which means that if... At least technically speaking, this range breaks down. He eats shit and he's immediately underwater, probably by some decent margin, right? Yeah, which is and, which uh, is really tricky. <laughs> the the thing is, the funny thing is, like, imagine like as like someone interested in coming into the space, seeing it low. Imagine seeing that from like a company that's basically all in crypto, right? They're underwater. You're basically buying their bags. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, <laughs> that would kind of make me shy away a little bit, even more so with how frantic he's been kind of pushing the narrative, because he already comes across as a little bit of a of a crazy person, right? Like if you're going on air and then just going like completely overboard, and he's telling people to like mortgage their houses to get real assets at like fifty k, and then he sometimes <laughs> yeah. just comes up with new things that don't make any sense. Like I saw one a couple of weeks ago where he's like, "Yeah, the USD isn't going anywhere." But you're gonna have dollar run on Bitcoin rails. It's like, dude, do, yeah. do you even like know slash care what you're talking about? It, it's really weird. It's like the extreme version of talking your own book. Yeah, and it's like, I mean, that's that, he. He sounds like a crazy person, and then you hear that, and you know that he's underwater, and you're like, okay. I mean, I don't know if he's fully there still. <laughs> right. I mean, the guy is obviously a really smart person. He, I, he just like sometimes just says stuff where I'm like, okay, dude. 
<laughs> calm down, yeah. right? Like if you're saying you should mortgage your your family's business to get more Bitcoin uh, because you're in such a rush, I don't know. Like I can't I can't agree with that. And anyone that's somewhat saying is not going to agree right. with that, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, he's been buying a bunch of Bitcoin, and I wouldn't have gotten as much money for mine if he didn't. So I mean, I'm thankful. Yeah, yeah, same. I'm very thankful as well. Um, so I don't know yeah. what you think. I made a tweet before my shit post. So the way it worked is I'm like, you know what, I'm going to try to tweet something semi-intelligent. And then no one gave a shit. So I tweeted a <laughs> meme instead and it got like 10 times the engagement, which is how social media works. Uh, but the point I made was that like Bitcoin is very memeable, which some people think is a weakness because it's like, well, is it a store of value? Is it a payment system? Is it a, you know, means of exchange, unit of account? native internet settlement money inflation hedge like what is it right and for some people that's a criticism because there's there's like no you no single unified use case it's like an identity problem whatever uh, but i actually think that's one of the bullish things about bitcoin uh, because it's it can be many things to m many people and also because it's just like internet money that's been around for a while it's very easy to meme it into narratives especially as layer twos and side chains and all that technological innovation comes through which allows it to be more um used slash flexible then it's quite easy to attach bitcoin to a macro narrative right so in a way as cynical as this sounds m my argument in that tweet was like even if a, like a specific narrative or a bull market driver dies out uh, it's it's quite likely I'd, li I'd like the odds slash i'd take the bet that it can kind of just attach itself uh, to another narrative whatever that may be it could be macro micro whatever like it's very memeable in that regard um and what i was kind of suggesting there implicitly as well was that the institutional fomo adoption narrative is kind of on its last legs right because the, the basic idea for that narrative was that sailor leads the charge uh, and then everyone else fucking follows because they become compelled that their balance sheet is like rotting away in USD. Uh, everything else is like overvalued slash a bad investment compared to Bitcoin. Therefore, um, it'll become common practice for companies to hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Um, that's kind of the base case slash argument, right? Um, instead, what we had was pretty much Sailor do it. And then Sailor double, triple, <laughs> you know, whatever, <laughs> be, basically yeah. lead the charge. He had that, you remember when he had that conference with like 10 zillion CEOs teaching them how to like put Bitcoin on their balance sheet? And we, we all kept coping super hard by saying, oh, well, it takes like six to 12 months or whatever from a regulatory point of view, blah, blah, blah. But ultimately, it's like no one accepts it. Like, yeah, of course, there have been some, uh, like Tesla being the main big one. But apart from MicroStrategy and Tesla... And Tesla having shown a willingness to trade around it slash Elon straight up fud it, right? Uh, that narrative really hasn't caught, caught that much steam. Uh, that That's sort of the elephant in the room. That the whole company's buying Bitcoin for balance sheet, at least on a, in relative terms or maybe relative to expectations post-Tesla, uh, it never really caught on, right? So now yeah. you've literally got just micro-strategy um, going balls deep this narrative and everyone else kind of watching from the sidelines. And um, so that may be a narrative that has done an amazing job, but more or less uh, run its course unless things start to change. Do you agree? Do you disagree? I mean, do you have any, what do you think of the institutional FOMO type of thing? Because I feel like it's kind of flattened out. And if we if we really look around us, it, it's mostly just Sailor and then Tesla with a bizarre love-hate relationship. Everyone else has been either marginal or willing to trade around that position. And it's not some like hodl strategy. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, the thing is, like, when even, I mean, Twitter's CEO, what's his name again? Jack Dorsey. Yeah. Like, oh, Square, he's, yeah. Yeah, like, he's super friendly to crypto, and they've basically put in a marginal amount. And it's like, when, like, people like him or, like, companies like Twitter with, like, CEOs that, that are super into it aren't doing what Sailor's doing, I mean, who else is going to do it, right? right? I mean... Only the crazy people did it, basically. Sailor and uh, Elon, right? And they're both, like, known to be a little bit of, like, yeah, going going above and beyond and doing, like, some, some crazy stuff. So, I mean, I don't think 
that is necessarily like the biggest attractor. Like that's not going to get companies to FOMO in. If anything, like if we get like a massive crash or something, I mean, we've seen that in 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 the housing crash back then. I mean, that's basically where Bitcoin comes from, right? If we see something like that again and people are like, holy shit, I really should have because I actually knew about Bitcoin and I mean, it's done its job during that crash. Um, I think then you might see it, but I don't think like people will have the foresight before anything happens and maybe something, nothing happens, right? Maybe the world is just like gonna truck along and do well. Right. And I don't think then you're gonna see like some crazy FOMO. Like that didn't make sense to me from the start. Um, but then again, like Sailor more than made up for like the lack of anyone else because he's been buying so much. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. I feel Sailor's just taken that to, to to some sort of extreme. But it's also true that like micro strategy as a business is like virtually non-existent at this at, that, at this point, right? Like let's call yeah. a spade a spade. Um, Sue, again, in that same podcast, made a really good point that, you know, MicroStrategy kind of just became a Bitcoin holding company. And that's yeah. it. That, that's all. That's pretty much what they do. Um, it's and, our little ETF, right? Yeah, it's our little <laughs> ETF. Um, and ever, other legit businesses who have real business models to worry about, it's, it's almost for the better that they don't take that type of existential risk by going balls deep um, Bitcoin. And again, this could be something that comes back, right? Like Sailor shows that it's possible. Maybe he stays alive, and then in another cycle, uh, it becomes more widely adopted for that use case once he's shown that you can actually survive. But even then, I think using micro strategy as a, as a precedent or as an example in terms of how to run a business is pretty. I, I don't know. Like they're pretty uniquely positioned. Uh, I don't think they there's like a, a, a useful template you can get from them. Like this is what it looks like when a company holds Bitcoin on its balance sheet, you know? Like MicroStrategy is not a good base example of that because that's yeah. all they do. They are literally like a Bitcoin <laughs> ETF. So. Yeah, I mean, they have good cash flow. They have a bunch of money that they don't need. I mean, they're perfectly made for this. Yes. But I agree, most companies aren't. I mean, Tesla isn't. And yeah. I mean, the crazy part is that we're basically at Tesla's entry, right? Yes. That's, I mean, that's boring. And in general, like, if you think about it, like, Tesla's been buying this, like, in this range. Um, Sailor's been buying, and he's starting to get underwater. Who's selling, right? And, um, I mean, to to part, obviously, minus, right? But, I mean, there's been some big cashing out going on in the 60K range. And, that, I mean, if you think about it, like, that's been three months of distribution, right? Um so it's going to take a while, even if this is bullish, which I'm not on board with. Um, but even if it is bullish, it's going to take a while to get us out of here. And then while while it's going sideways, I don't think you're going to see any FOMO. If anything, I could see um, Tesla actually pulling out as well. I mean, I don't trust Elon further than, than I can throw, <laughs> throw a stone like at this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so. this on-chain reaccumulation is certainly taking its time. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I agree. The Yeah, totally. I, I don't know whether Tesla's going to, like, puke out. Um, I'd be surprised, but at this point, maybe that's, that's you know, what's the most surprising slash unexpected outcome and expect that from Tesla? I don't have any strong views in that regard. Uh, but if they publicly announce that they've sold, I think that would just send us to, you know, quick visit to Hades. At that yeah, point. that's what I was about to say. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that wouldn't be good news to say the least. So yeah. that's, you know, pretty good 30 odd minutes on news, narratives, etc. Um, like the video if that was helpful. We'll leave us a comment. Let us know if you want this to be a regular feature. I'll probably try to do it on most Mondays. I won't always have the luxury of having the duck with me, um, but it just kind of helps to sum up a few things and see where we're at beyond just the charts. So... Okay, technical stuff. Um, kind of want to look at Bitcoin, ETH, and a few altcoins, although for obvious reasons, uh, no huge rush in that regard. So monthly, still like nothing to write home about for the time being. Uh, the only relevant monthly level is pretty much the low. So previous month's low. This doesn't look great at the moment, but you know, high time frame levels are so far away. Or monthly levels are so far away that I'm not going to lean particularly heavily on this time frame. On the weekly, 
I think last week's title was that Bitcoin is showing non-trivial signs of reversal. And if there was any bullish case to be made, I think it had to be during the course of last week. Uh, and the reason for that is you finally had a high time frame close above resistance, which was this weekly above 3800. And so at that point, the reasonable trades were either daily close through 40 and then trade into the previous uh, floor at 45 to 49, or you close above on the weekly and then in the first few days of the week, you nuke into lower time frame structure. You assume that that's going to be your intra week wick and then break 40 and travel from weekly level to weekly level. Um, and that just didn't happen, right? It didn't happen. You closed above and then uh, the next week closed below. So you actually got a failed breakout, failed reclaim, whatever, range high fake out at this weekly structure, which is really, really rough. It, it's it's not what you want to see uh, if you're bullish. The fact that, you know, price is repeatedly testing the only weekly structure slash support that it has on this time frame, and the best it can offer from that support uh, is a... Un is an unsuccessful breakout at resistance. That's kind of a, a bit of a red flag, first of all. Uh, and obviously this week pretty much has seen continuation in that direction. And we keep banging our head uh, against the weekly range low at 32, 33K. Um, so I was more than happy to buy 33, whatever, this range low and actually the wick the first time, that was like the easiest trade you're going to get. Uh, and I have not participated in any of these subsequent dips into this structure. Uh, it's one of those where I don't want to sell support, but unless something changes structurally, I don't have a setup to buy it either. And that's totally fine. It's sometimes okay to look at levels and say, you know, I'm not going to trade against it, but I'm not going to trade in its direction either because the easier slash easy setups uh, have already played out slash taken place. Uh, I know you were a bit more uh, active on the, basically in the crab range and buying support uh, in the low 30s. Uh, I, I've been sidelined for those, um, but it seems like that's kind of where we're at for the time being. For me, at least, it's a level that is support, but I don't, I, unless something changes, I don't have a setup to buy it. So I probably need some sort of, I don't know, if I had to spitball ideas, a daily break through 30 that takes out all of the lows we built up in the range, and then some sort of strong reclaim, which allows me to define my risk or show me strong evidence of buying sub 30k without breaking too far away from the level. At that point, at least I've got somewhere to put a stop, something risk defined to play back inside the range, maybe towards the range high, midpoint, whatever. Um, the difficulty with rebuying. While I think it's a technically a totally fine idea to buy support, the reason I'm not compelled to do so is because, well, A, I've already played it, so that's fine. You know, I, I took the easiest trade available in the whole range. But also, in terms of, like, what's available right now, uh, if you're wrong, you're probably going to be really, really wrong. Uh, and, and I mean, like, a 6K style break where if you're on the wrong side of that high time frame move, it'll just teleport and, like, not let you out until it really, really destroys uh, whatever average you've brought yourself into. There probably isn't going to be any type of nice retest or retest of your entry, consolidation. Like, if you're wrong buying this range low for, like, whatever, the fourth time, uh, you'll feel it. And and for me, it's just not worth it uh, as a bet doing business at that same level with the probabilities decreasing slash working against me uh, with every time that it gets tested. So I don't want to be a seller into this level um, because... I don't have high time frame evidence, at least purely technically, to suggest that it's going to nuke. Uh, but I'm not rushing to buy it unless it gives me the kind of wipeout and subsequent strength that will A, suggest actual buying, and B, give me somewhere um, to put a stop. And in terms of my own personal um, trading, as you were aware, uh, I was willing to trade the continuation through 40k. Uh, I didn't get it just got smacked down as at resistance. And then the other structure that I was open-minded towards trading was the second idea that we close above 38k and then the nuke intra-week is going to be the higher low um, before another attempt at 40, which makes a higher high and breaks whatever. Um, the structure which 
we spoke about last week was this shelf made up of the weekly level and the monthly area at 37k. Um, I actually punted this daily consolidation around the extreme, and I pretty much just got lucky. And, and Don knows this, because we were in a Google Meets room together, waiting for Max Bornen uh, to discuss whatever, the Technical Roundup podcast episode, which you should listen to. And I got filled on that drop, right? And I'm like, hey, I'm long, it's, you know, this is going to be the bottom, etc. And then he joined the call, you know, he was a bit late. And so I was thinking, okay, well, I might as well trade if the podcast is going to be called off. I don't want to be in a trade during the podcast, but it was 30 minutes past the starting point. So I was like, well, fuck it, you know, I'll, if it's a setup, it's a setup. But then two things happened. One, he showed up, so I'm like, okay, I'm going to close this out because whatever, like, I don't want to manage a position uh, while trying to record and ask intelligent questions. But maybe the thing that was slightly more compelling was you, you were quite adamant that I would eat shit <laughs> on that long, <laughs> or at the very least that it would reach lower than my entry. Uh, so those yep. two factors together, I think I held that trade, what was it, like 10 minutes? 5, 10 minutes? Yeah, I roughly. closed out for, like, <laughs> lunch money, and then watched the market nuke. Uh, but that's pretty much it. This good anecdote slash story aside, though, uh, this is, to me, is very much the case of when you have a good bullish setup, which fails, uh, that's bearish. And so you had this higher high or weekly breakout, uh, every opportunity to find support or some sort of higher low in the mid-30s, and the market's having um, none of it. So that kind of gives you a sense of flows. So ideas, what, what am I looking for, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, as I said, I think if you want to be bullish, on a higher time frame point of view, this is still the last support we have. So it makes sense. I'm never going to put anyone off doing business at the extremes. I'm personally not doing it for the reasons mentioned. So unless washes out and gives me something, uh, I don't want to blindly rebuy this level for the end of time. If we start to rally intra-week from this range low, uh, my first trouble area is the weekly midpoint at 35k and maybe even the failed support at 36, 37, thereabouts. But nothing at the moment looking at this uh, compels me to enter any positions or kind of rush into the market for the time being. Of course, again, that may change if I get a setup that I like. But right now, just kind of a blind buy of support. Uh, been there, done that. I need to see a bit more to to get interested. Um, that's at least my... And obviously, you know, if, if 30k range breaks, sailors underwater, big level broken breakdown from a multi-week consolidation and that's kind of the armageddon scenario to bear in mind as well uh sorry for ranting on there don what do you think of bitcoin or anything i've said there uh i mean i can press in really quick yeah go for it so i mean i totally agree with what you said even like deleting all my levels deleting all like that i have on the chart right um Looking at this, right, this is what happened. So di diagonal traders got that breakout. Horizontal traders got that breakout. And they got faded so hard. I mean, this is disgusting how hard this was. Yeah. The funniest thing is, Sailor was sitting here trying to buy this. And he got straight up nuked through <laughs> in no time whatsoever. And it's now trading much, much lower. Like, I've, on a lower time frame chart as a daily, I mean, I've not seen it be more bearish than this in a long, long time. I mean, this is just like the perfect kind of setup to ruin everyone's day, right? You get the breakout on both diagonal, diagonals and horizontals. You got Sailor to buy. You got a bunch of stuff and nothing worked. This thing just dumped off. I don't really see a reason for this um, to go up now because at the end of the day, what we had if you're looking at this, right, this is the range low. We had a shakeout on the range low, mm -hmm. so we went to the range high, right? And I mean, that's all well and good, but what you really shouldn't be getting is a retest of that, right? Because this was already basically stopping everyone out, right? Why do you need to revisit this area? Mm -hmm. Even more so when you have like stuff on the bid side. I mean, you had Sailor buy here, you had a bunch of stuff, uh, people get euphoric again. Um, why go back there, right? And I mean, it can obviously still go up, but for me, either you take out the lows, and I mean, there's like some almost equal ones down here, yeah. um, or you just completely roll this over. But anything but that, I mean, I don't really see the point 
I, I don't want to get in front of this right before everyone else gets stopped out because I know that a bunch of people are going to be buying the range low that they think like the 32K support that, I mean, I've been talking about for, for weeks now and you have as well. I know that there's a bunch of people in position there, right? And their stops are going to be in the 30Ks. Mm -hmm. And if they get rolled over, all of the stops get rolled over. And I mean, for me, that makes no sense, right? You get in there, you're like, let's say you have your stop at like 30, 31K. I think you're probably not going to get out before 30K. And then, I mean, I don't know. I just don't want to be stuck in that. Um, and if it gets even worse, you might even get completely wrecked by, by a wick way below 30K. Even if it's bullish, right? Like if this was bullish, if this is a bullish range, what I'd expect is a wick down low and then a rally, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be very surprised if we just caught a bit here for no reason whatsoever and went up. Like makes no sense to me. Even more so with, like you said, the weekly looking as trash as it does. Because this yeah. is like legitimately one of the worst setups that you can have. Like <laughs> yeah, break out into. And the thing is like, this is on the weekly, right? We have this on the weekly. And then we have the same setup, like I showed earlier, with the diagonal and the horizontal on the daily, right? So you have like the perfect confluence on all the counts. Um, I don't want to fade that. I don't see the point. Like, I've been buying this low a couple of times. I'm not going to do it again. Um, I'm going to be sitting there waiting for people to either get liquidated that I can buy um, or just at lower supports. And if I'm not going to get that, I be fine with buying higher is what it is right mm -hmm. but the trade in me says that even though like this is support this is one of the worst places to get long and i mean i'm more than than happy to be proven wrong on that because i mean then bitcoin goes up it's fine by me unfortunately that makes a lot of sense um yeah i i pretty much agree i like my system, and this is more on the discretionary side of things, I can't blindly buy this for the fourth time. Um, unless like something really crazy happens or there's some low time frame pattern that I recognize and want to jump on. Um, it's still support. Again, I, I don't want to sell this thing. I have no reason to, to start shorting literally the do or die structure of a <laughs> Yeah, shorting just to be sounds super like clear, a bad idea. Right? You, you don't, yeah. you, like, shorting the extreme is probably dense or at least that's not like the trade in terms of making good decisions or whatever uh, but i feel like the the easy buys at these levels for me within my system have have kind of run their course which means i need to see some sort of extension a real effort to break which results in a trap and then i can participate and i don't mind waiting for that or i have to do business at higher prices which i have no issues doing as well um, but again context at this point is important i'm not like trying to make anything back you know I, i'm not forced to make important decisions about my portfolio because you have to realize for some people uh, they're pretty much just held the whole time right like from 60k i've just been holding and then they're, now they're confronted with the fact that okay this is either the bottom or it's going to go down another whatever what what is it 20k like another 40 percent, right and this is like the extreme where they have to make that decision so in those circumstances maybe their decision making process uh, is a bit different and the, the stakes are a bit different. But for me, fortunately, uh, I'm, I'm kind of on cruise control, to be honest, man. I, I, I can afford myself the luxury of only really taking A-plus really good setups um, because I didn't give anything back and I feel good about that. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, that, I mean, that's... You should. you should, considering how the market's moved. Like, that was some nasty stuff. I mean, we haven't seen that in a long, long time since like i mean since years basically a drop up like more than 40 percent yes just straight out of like nowhere basically i mean it wasn't out of nowhere we had like a bearish range but for everyone that didn't recognize it as a bearish range i mean that just came out of the left field right yes um agreed so yeah in terms of bias for the week um i unless something really changes can't blindly buy the low to mid, whatever, low 30s, despite it being weekly support. Uh, what's weighing or well, kind of the overbearing technical narrative is still the fake out at the range high. Probably the most, like if we want to talk about extreme cases, probably the most bullish thing that can happen uh, is pretty much the same what happened at the range high happening at the range low, right? Um, like if, if we, 
I, I don't love these counterfactuals. So I will talk about like, what's the most bullish thing that can happen? What's the most bearish thing that can happen? And then my kind of rough trading plans for the week. So the most bullish thing would be, hey, look, so we're still dealing within weekly structure and we're still at the extreme of weekly support. Because below that, there's nothing until 20K. And that's another 40% drop. And that obviously means we're in a decision point. Now, sometimes ranges like to form sort of mirrors, right? So you have an attempt to break to the upside, which fails and takes you to the downside. So maybe in the most bullish case, we have the same thing on the other side of the range. So here, attempt to break, no acceptance, number go down. Maybe we have attempt to break, no acceptance and number go up. And then we basically keep the crab alive between 30 and 40K on chain redemption arc that this is some sort of reaccumulation and then 40K unlikely to act as resistance. And we come back to those um, pre breakdown levels at 50K. That's probably, you know, if, if you want actual non invented bullish hopium, I think that's your best outcome that, hey, we're still in a range this breakout didn't work, this breakdown isn't going to work, and then we would have a reaccumulate and then number go up. Uh, I don't think that's super likely, personally. Um, but if you want to make the max bullish argument, I think that's what it looks like. Um, I mean, that's obviously, when I say max bullish, obviously max bullish is just like, everyone goes all in Bitcoin forever and it goes to all time high. But I mean, in terms of realistic scenarios for which there's maybe some evidence or some sort of symmetry, whatever. Uh, what's the most bearish case? I mean, the most bearish one is kind of the one that Don presented. That you have a multi time frame failed breakout, um, pretty much textbook bearish price action, daily lower low close that nukes through even the extreme of the daily range. And then basically this whole consolidation ends up being impulse down, consolidate, impulse down, and takes us to 20K as the first trouble area. That's, that's you know, the, the max bearish outcome uh, to bear in mind. And just like there is some evidence for the m bullish case based on the weekly time frame, there's obviously evidence for this on the daily time frame because it looks like unless something gets rescued in the next few hours and in the absence of a reclaim it does look like um there's a daily range breakdown here like you, you guys know when we talked about bullish setups that double deviations are rare so you have resistance resistance market breaks above breaks back below right that's your whatever deviation failed breakout if the market then trades back above that original level once again it's much less likely to be a double deviation and it's just more likely to be a reclaim into a moon right you don't double fake a range unless your range is dog shit or the conditions are dog shit you can kind of apply the same logic to support so you had your support you had your failed breakdown and so if the market f goes below that original level again it's much less likely to be another fake out and much more likely to just be a, a break down uh, so that's something to bear in mind and a level to keep in mind as well. And that's sort of what I was uh, pivoting into in terms of stuff to watch for this week. Uh, I pretty much have two levels um, derived from the weekly slash daily. One is, of course, this weekly range low at 32k, um, kind of the last support we have. So obviously paying attention to that, especially in terms of high time frame closes. Um, the second one is this weekly mid range at 35k, which is also that daily range, which looks to be broken. So if there are going to be any rallies from this level, uh, if the market's bullish, it really shouldn't be finding resistance there because that would <laughs> that would kind of confirm that we're fucked. Because uh, if this comes back here like a fourth or fifth time, I mean, it, you probably w probably won't spend any time there at all. Uh, so that's sort of my roadmap for this week. Chat, let me know if that makes sense. Um, Duck, anything to add for the time being? No, I agree with it. We've got basically the same thing. I mean, I think if this low gives on a closing basis, it's probably going to be with like, because I've seen this around where people are like, okay, if it closes below here, I'm just going to get out. Or if this <laughs> closes below here, I'm going to start shorting. But how this is going to close below if it's not going to be today, right? Because like I said, I could see this close here, bounce a little and then yeah. go for the for the nose dive right but the the candle that's going to close through this level is going to look like this 
and then have fun. Like if at that, if at that point you're getting short, you're gonna get wrecked because it's gonna like mean revert back. Um, but I seriously think like this level goes, the market goes, and you're not gonna get any confirmation. Um, that makes it incredibly difficult to trade on the short side of things because you don't want to be shorting support, right? Yeah. So if you shorted the range high at 40k, I mean, well, well done because I mean that wasn't the easiest short to take. Um, I mean, technically it was like the perfect short setup, um, at least for my system, where it just closed out resistance, spiked above it, and then just immediately broke down, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but with this, like, if you just if you're just starting to short now, I mean, that's it could easily bounce, and it could easily just be another test of the of the range low. Yeah. It's just it's unlikely to me. If I had to give it odds i would say 80 percent we break down 20 percent we bounce it's completely pulled out of my out of my ass but i mean that's kind of like where i'm from that's why i don't want to be buying this because even if the risk reward is really good it would have to be like five times as good because i mean the odds of this going up in my mind at least are so slim yeah and your um, risk is like illusionary at that point yeah because you're probably going to get slipped and stopped like a, a million takes so yes yeah. so even if you're like sitting here being like okay i'm gonna take this trade um with my stop here and oh my, my target God, here yeah. like a complete maniac right even if you take this if you're like okay the odds of this going up are like only 20 percent um it's suddenly a much worse trade right then you kind of have to give much much more like the odds are just that much worse and the trade is that much we worse. just double your stop in and then you have <laughs> yeah. to double your stop on yeah, top of yeah. it because yeah if this breaks down it's gonna slip you a yeah. whole lot and the bigger your position gets the worse it's gonna slip you so um yeah it's just not for me uh, and i've i mean it's still support and if you have a setup i don't want to be like the guy that for sure same shit talks you out of a out of a decent setup it's just for my system it doesn't work yeah. Even also given we have equal lows here. I don't know if anyone noticed, but yeah, it's a tricky one. Like this is basically equal lows. Buying I mean, support we... barely above a double bottom is so so tricky. Um yeah. which is why you want to trade the first test of those structures. You don't have to worry about shit. Yep. Because like, okay, well it's either bounces here and it's like a straight liquidation driven move down, or crypto goes to zero in one candle. You know, that bet is much easier <laughs> to take. It may, it may seem scarier, but that bet is a much better bet than buying it for the fourth time. Um, yeah, that, that, yeah, there was no follow up to that. It's just like <laughs> trading but, trading the nuke the first times first time round or fading the whatever bullzooka the first time round is almost always going to be better than waiting for it to prove its support or resistance after like eight tests. And then by the time it's the ninth test, then you finally have the courage to trade it. Like you just get you you you, you eat a big plate of shit. Um, yeah. So yeah. A good way to think about it um, is this week. The first week was forced sellers. No one wanted to sell there. It, like people got forced to sell. Right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this right here, no one's forced to sell here. Like this isn't like forced anything this is just people want to sell people want to get out right so in this case on the left side of things the people that get liquidated or get forced out of the position they want to they're going to be interested in getting in again right in this case not that much the case so i mean for me this is much easier to buy yeah. i agree yep 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 first test best test agreed intramoto agreed um cool have you looked much at ETH? ETH USD is so garbage, man. So, looking at ETH USD, let me open up Coinbase. And yeah, like the video if you've learned anything, or even if you haven't. Just if, if you're alive and capable of understanding this message. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so monthly time frame, you kind of look at this and think, well, this was fun. Um, you know, whatever, fine. In terms of the weekly, again, I've already played the easy bounce the first time it came around uh, into 1800s, right? 1850s, just under 1900. And that to me was like the extreme of this breakout structure here. Um, and it seems like we're coming back down again. For example, if the weekly time frame makes a lower low 
through that liquidation candle low, then I think that the first reasonable level to look for is actually the previous all-time high at 1400 or thereabouts. Um, so this is one of those, again, where yes, it's at technical support at around 1900, but if you're if you buy it and you're wrong, you take a massive haircut until the next reasonable area, um, which is just like you know, just similar to Bitcoin, about thirty percent away. And if you didn't buy it the first time or the second time, you know, with with each consecutive test, it becomes a harder case to get involved and hold that type of setup, right? Um, and yeah, market structure point of view, it really for the moment. Yes, technical support, short term, whatever, but it kind of looks like the, the ass is falling out of this thing. Lower highs, lower lows, and just this like, <laughs> actually like at an accelerating rate, right? Like the good old um, death scythe um, bit of price action. So Yeah, that's just a parabola, right? Right. In the making, anyway. If I had a dollar every time Cred mentions he bought the first nuke, oh, Dark Knight, if only, man. I feel so good <laughs> about that shit. Um, <laughs> Yeah, with all. I mean, you bought the absolute peak of bottom. Yeah, that was People crazy. Gotta give you a break, right? I know. Um, but yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, this looks complete garbage to me. But where, what it, is it, where is structure for you on ETH USD? Do you have like a chart you can you can share with us? Um, yeah. So okay. I mean, this is basically. I mean, we are here right right now, and I mean. I would say pretty much the same thing. Okay. You're doing like, I think this was basically a blow off top into a giant nuke, into a complacency bounce that didn't even get to the first resistance. Now we're testing the lows again, basically down here. I think the biggest move is yet to come, basically. Um, at least in terms of how many people are going to get wrecked. Not necessarily in, okay, we're going to, like, we lost like two grand, so we're going to go to zero. But in the sense that I could easily see this like go back down like another forty percent or even fifty. Um, so for me, this like one point four k area is right. the next support. I wouldn't want to be buying like this one because it's been tested a bunch of times. Um, if this breaks down, goes to like one four, I'm gonna try to play the bounce to one nine. And Finally, I have no a idea. long idea. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have no idea if. Like, if we're going to get that bounce, I'm going to see if it's strong or not, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to be buying, like, the all -time, the previous all-time high. Right. And um, if we get any, like, super, super strong move into, like, 2K, I might hold it for a little longer. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, I'm expecting this, like, if just looks to me like it needs, like, a year sideways. And, I mean, I could be wrong. Like, if this is super cycle, goes back up, I mean, nice. I'm still going to, like, I'm going to buy the bottom or, like, try to buy the bottom. Maybe I get run over. But, I mean, if 1.4K gets run over, I mean, where do we go? Triple-digit right? shitcoin if that happens. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, at that point, I mean, we're all in deep shit. So, right. I might as well. Yeah, exactly. I love um, those levels, right? Like, when you're, when you're facing existential dread uh, on the other side <laughs> of the barrel. Yep. Like, like, yeah, it's... Those levels are the best, both on intraday perspectives, but especially for higher time frame structure. Like sometimes crypto will just get to a point where it's like, look, if, if no one wants it here, they, they won't want it anywhere, right? And, yeah. and those are sometimes the best bets to take, even if it, all you get is like a low time frame crumb of reversion. It's just like there's so much asymmetry built into those levels uh, that you absolutely have to punt. And for those, like those levels, I agree, are 1400 ETH, if it gets there, right? The previous all-time high, bottom of the range. You've got to play something there. Because if not there, then where? And then the answer is... I mean, I mean, God knows, right? Then it's like... We, we just erased whatever huge portion of price action. So if 1400 doesn't hold, this thing gets absolutely fucked. So you might as well bet at 1400 Because then you'll have a long time to go think about the, the, <laughs> the consequences of your actions and decisions while the market tries to find the floor elsewhere. I think the yeah. same as, like, can be similarly applied, applied to Bitcoin. Like, if it nukes through 30, um, there's very little doubt in my mind that it goes to 20. Um, the only other caveat is there, there is some pretty compelling structure from a higher time frame point of view at, like, 
12 to 14 if for some reason it goes sub 20. But again, we're at support right now at 32, so I want to keep some perspective. Uh, but just on the topic of those levels where you just have to fucking trade them, right? You have to, because they'll only come about once every whatever, quarter, year, whatever. Uh, I think 20k Bitcoin, you know, all pandemonium breaks loose. That's where you put your big boy pants on, 20k, and then if it goes lower than steal from your family and fund fund your lungs and then 1400 ETH uh, in a similar type of vein if this yeah. breakdown is going to have any legs so someone someone in the chat asked about like what is a strong bounce and a weak bounce and I can show this real go quick. on um so I mean, the best example is Bitcoin right now um you look at this right you have like a range you break down and now look at how relatively like how this bounce sucked um in comparison to the move down right so you have like a straight move down here of like 50 percent right and then you get one candle basically erasing a bunch of that getting like people that chase the short getting them stopped out and basically buying up the liquidations right and then the entire following range never managed to get back above the highest point of that and that's like the biggest weakness that I've seen in a long time. Like this, like whenever you get like these nukes and they, they can't even bounce back to like that level. I mean, that's a pretty damn weak bounce. Now it can, this can still turn around and do it, right? But like, you can just see how this structurally just basically went down and sideways from the first bounce, right? And then you have other ones where you have like a breakdown and structurally, this is moving upwards, right? Um, this one is a little bit of an anom anomaly because of sailor buys. But in general, like, look at how this moved afterwards. Like, you had this nuke down and then the structure that it's building. And I mean, that wasn't true, like, at the start, but at least, like, going into, like, the 7Ks, this just went basically, like, curled upwards. And that's what you want to be seeing. You don't want to be seeing this and then just sideways or this even worse and then just like this curling downward shit. Um, obviously depends on much, much more. This is just on the first glance. You can see how funding is playing. You can see in general, like how market sentiment is. And I mean, that's pretty much well described by funding, but there's a bunch of other stuff involved too, like f uh, futures and stuff. Um, but in general, like sometimes you get these massive nukes down and then you get a strong candle to the upside and then you revisit that like never make a higher low and then just start bleeding upwards. And that's what you want to be seeing. What we've been seeing here is breakdown, immediate revisit, another revisit, another revisit. And that's not what I mean by strong bounce. Now, it could turn into one at some point, but like right now, this is just glaring weakness to me. My answer in terms of is it a strong or weak bounce is that most of the time I don't have the luxury of making that decision slash it doesn't matter because I'm just going to assume it's going to be a good enough bounce for me to trade. And if I wait too long for any type of confirmation, a lot of the time, at least for my short term strategy, I'm like sacrificing um, a good entry. So I kind of just prefer to smack it. And then if it's a weak bounce... My PNL will show that. <laughs> if it's a good bounce, my PNL will show that as well. You know, um, but yeah, when it, when you're dealing with like a range, for sure, you want to see how the market is reacting uh, to the level you're trying to trade. And if it's spending like a ton of time there and making you know lower highs and weaker bounces and just being stuck at support uh, is generally not a good look. Now that doesn't mean you have to sell support, but you know with each subsequent test. The probability of a high time frame reversal or that level starting to do its job better is generally lower. So then the question becomes, okay, well then is num test number three, how much worse is it than test number four, blah, blah, blah. I just like to avoid engaging in all that reasoning. So I just smack it the first time round and pray. So I don't need to deal with that dilemma, for, like for the most part. Um, which I think is a totally valid strategy if you know how to trade kind of blind slash the first time around. But yeah, like the basic heuristic is like, is the level doing its job? Like, what does it mean for support to do its job? Well, it means number go up. 
Uh, and you want to see evidence of buying, so like low time frame bullish patterns working out, market structure being positive, higher highs and higher lows, etc. If if you arrive at a level and it's not doing its job, then that you know it's kind of just a results based assessment. If you want a, a clear answer, it's you know it'll be one of two. One is kind of my version. Is it strong or weak? It's like well, your your trade will tell you that. Uh, and you don't always have the luxury of waiting for confirmation if you want to trade the structure. Sometimes you just got to smack it. Uh, and then as you're managing the trade or you're in the position, you can make that kind of evolving assessment as to whether it's strong or weak. Uh, that's the first one. And the second answer is like, you need some basic criteria for what it means for price to be supported uh, or for price to be resisted. Whether that's candle closes, lower time frame market structure, uh, maybe a change in futures data, volume, whatever, uh, you need like a basic heuristic to tell you whether one side is doing its job properly uh, or not. Uh, and I think market structure slash candle closes is a decent place to start if you then want to carve out your own your own niche, um, in my opinion, at least. Yeah, I mean, you just smack it. And this is what I thought he implied. Just you, you buy the low, you hold on to it and then you're figuring out should i hold on to this long or not and the answer is yeah this shouldn't be really, like one it shouldn't go back to your entry at least not several times and like especially with these liquidation events because they usually like they should be printing the low because no one else should get the opportunity to buy those and then hey did you know everything. i bought the first liquid <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's what it is. Um, there's no easy way and you, you're never going to be sure. Right. It's just um, sometimes, sorry, excuse me, Ooh. I'm eating. I'm eating next to it. Um, sometimes you uh, you see weakness and then you're just like, fuck this, not going to bother with it. And that's what I'm seeing right now. That's why I'm not bothering, even though I'm like, I I made even made the crab up, right? With the 32K, 40K <laughs> nice. thing. Um, not bore it, bothering right now. Just crypto creds yeah. burner in the chat says the whole crypto market <laughs> will go to zero. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean that's stupid as well. <laughs> I mean that's the thing, right? People are always, and this is something I've noticed on social media and everywhere basically. Like people are always in the extremes. It's not like okay, I mean we're not in a bull market anymore, quite obviously because I mean we just dumped sixty percent. <laughs> um, no, no, it's but, actually because we death crossed. You know, we dropped sixty percent. Uh, it didn't mean anything, but then the death cross happened, and then you know, I'm like, "Wait, guys, are we? Uh, what happened? Are we not bullish anymore?" That's when I w I kind of woke up. What about you? <laughs> no, I mean it's I, I don't know. Like this entire discussion, like it always goes to the extremes, and it's I I don't know. I I don't get it. Yeah. But I mean, it is I think a sign of the times. Basically, people don't hold moderate um, views anymore, which is Bitcoin is going down. It's trending down right now. Yeah, but it's still bullish and it's been going up for the last 10 years but you also don't have to use um stock to flow to kind of justify that you can just see that it's gone up for the last 10 years and it's like this thing where people convince themselves of stuff um out of like bullshit reasoning and then just are so headstrong that they kind of stop thinking about it afterwards they're just like fighting for their garbage reasoning, basically. And it's so frustrating to see. Because if you want to be doing this like longer term, be it investment, investing or like trading, you got to be at least as reasonable enough that you can see like whether something is like makes sense or not. And whether you are actually completely making stuff up. Because I mean, every one of us has done that before, right? I've been holding, like I held Neo from from five dollars basically to like 200 and then i was telling myself even though like i had made plans to sell at levels um and i was telling myself dude this might be it and this might be the next big thing right <laughs> and like try to cope myself out of basically selling this thing which would have been a giant mistake um so i mean we've all gone through it it's just like at some point you gotta kind of realize that you're sabotaging yourself. And we live and in I an echo that's... chamber as well, right? So yeah. that's something to, to be able to confront. Someone asked, like, Cred, Don, do you guys only do TA or also FA? Like, if you asked me a year ago, I'd be very heavy technical only. 
Um, now I think you answered this question really well on stream. Like when you look at context, when you look at narratives, when you look at futures data in the context of the narratives and kind of use TA to provide additional information and you blend it all together, that's kind of a mixed approach, right? It's not like we don't know what happens in Bitcoin. Like we don't care about the news, don't care about anything. It's like just wake up, no news sources, no data, just look at the chart and then trade, trade the lines. Um, that would be a TA only approach. But I feel like we have a pretty balanced approach when it comes to TA and FA. But that's the thing, when people think FA, they think like on chain or like other random stuff. But even just like looking at narratives and how price is responding to narratives or looking at news and trends in that news or how price is responding to news, that's still fundamental um, to me, at least to some extent. Also, someone asked earlier uh, whether we ever disagree on anything. I don't think people know that in DMs, I am literally the number one counter indicator, like in this <laughs> entire market. Like it's it's not even funny. I, I I'd be like bullish on every single green candle before like a ten percent nuke, and I, I'm just like the perfect counter indicator. The thing is, I can like ignore myself. I know how to, I know how to trade around it. Like my my short term feelings are just noise, and I'll spam the duck with DMs. You'll call me an idiot. <laughs> I'll feel good because I go on side for like <laughs> five ticks and then the market <laughs> will nuke. So we do disagree like a shit ton because my short term gut is like the best counter indicator in the market. But whenever it tells me a signal, I'll tell him he'll call me an idiot and then he'll usually end up being right. Um, if I traded my gut feeling, I would be destitute, like completely <laughs> broke, not a penny to my name. And that's the thing, like when we were in the 50, whatever, 50K range, or whatever, 50, 50, 60K range at the top. I'd been sitting in USD for like a few weeks, but I was a bull tard. You remember this, Don, right? Like every single do, time yeah. we dipped, I was like, oh my God, dude, this is it. We're like going to 100. How can you be bearish when ETH looks like this? Look at these altcoins, blah, blah, blah. But then you'd keep asking me, okay, but did you long? Did you long? Are you back in? I'd say, no, I'd never set up. Uh, so we do disagree a shit ton, usually because I'm an idiot. <laughs> but at least I kind of know that I'm an idiot and I, and I try to keep it away from my trading. So that's... That's to answer that question. Yeah, I mean, you got to give yourself more credit. I mean, the thing is, like, I'm just in general more cautious leaning and more high time frame leaning, right. I'd say. And um, so I miss a bunch of stuff, but I'm usually like at least somewhere right of the direction. And um, but like I said, miss stuff and you're going to take more, but be fine, like with that, because I mean, if you take more and the, the average still evens out, it's completely fine. But uh, yeah. So yeah, if 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 you want a counter indicator, then there's like <laughs> an amazing one in the market. It's just you know requires requires friendship, I suppose. Um, I think we've covered most of it. Someone asked about altcoins. I've been totally uninterested in altcoins ever since like the first nuke, um, or certainly this continuation nuke here, uh, because market structure just got completely obliterated on virtually every single altcoin. And then they rallied like 100% and that was a rally into resistance. And since then the market's been weak and all the decoupling dispersion narratives have pretty much eaten shit. And altcoins are just like basically collateral for these precarious looking um, Bitcoin and Ethereum positions. Also bear in mind that a lot of DeFi funds can't effectively hedge their DeFi holdings because the market's not big enough or rather they are too big in this market. So probably the, the, the second best thing they can do is to sell ETH or hedge via Ethereum. Um, so if you want market signals, you kind of have to look at the big boys Bitcoin for general crypto risk appetite, whatever, and then ETH for what is the money in altcoins doing. Um, and I think a lot of people are getting and will continue to be burned by strong DeFi decoupling narratives. That doesn't mean they can't be right in the future, um, but for the time being, it's uh, that's not a book that I would want to hold um, personally. So yeah, for me to be interested in altcoins, uh, I need to be higher time frame uh, my risk appetite for altcoins generally is pretty damn low for the most part so for me to be bullish said the guy who had like everything in ftt on the way up anyway uh, my, my risk appetite is like pretty you know i'm conservative when it comes to altcoins so i need to have very minimal 
slash no concerns about higher time frame crypto trend. And then I'll go out on the risk curve. And even then I'll mostly be punting blue chip altcoins, top 50, 30, whatever, coin market cap, maybe some DeFi stuff, whatever. That's that's as far as my altcoin mandate goes. Um, but yeah, it's mostly just been a story of first Bitcoin and Ethereum and now just pretty much Bitcoin. Um, and I, I, I'm not hugely, I, I don't see great reasons for spending all of this time looking at altcoins at the moment and it's been that way for a while what about you is that i broadly? mean yeah i mean i'm even more aggressive i think tops in for coins right and i think if you bought dogecoin in the one case you're probably never gonna get outbreak even <laughs> i think there's a bunch of stuff that rallied way beyond where it should have um especially in the meme coin stage and i don't think that's gonna give an, a good exit it's gonna give like a bad one right but for me personally, I'm treating this as start of a bear cycle for the old coins. I could see Bitcoin go up still. I am very, very, very much opposed to the notion that old coins are just going to do another one. Like, I think old coins are through. Um, could be wrong. I, I mean, I just don't own, like, I even sold recently my last old coins OTC that I had. Um, even though I was bullish on them generally, just because I think we're heading into an old coin bear market. Um, and I mean, the, the the funny thing is like, you could be saying, yeah, you're saying this after like a 70% drawdown. The thing is, this can go down 90% more, I think. Like Dogecoin, for example, like from the current point in BTC, like in BTC terms, Doge BTC, if it goes down 98%, it's basically where I want to buy it. Nice, so, yeah. Sniper, hey, sniper entry. Um, yeah, I mean, take it with a grain of salt. I mean, I'm generally not a big old coin bull. Um, so I could be like leaning myself too far out the window. But like, if I'm completely honest, I, I don't think there's going to be much, much of positive price action in the next coming, coming weeks to months to maybe even years. Have you seen DeFi perp? Like if you open the stream or whatever, <clears throat> um, this is, this is what DeFi perp looks like. This is like the, the strongest performing sector i mean dogecoin aside like sector wise yeah um this is like altcoin strength and whatever institutional presence that's going to be an altcoin this is what the the basket slash sector looks like um that's not it's just like a worse version of ethereum right mm -hmm. um, yeah i mean it looks if if looks actually decent in comparison yes, to this yes stuff. ETH has structure has some some stuff but in comparison, in comparison to this, it looks appalling. Just to, you know, in 24 hours, technical roundup, the newsletter is going to come out. trletter.com, free, one email per week. Last time we brought up the DeFi perp index and our view on altcoins um, was, I think, this bearish retest here. Yeah. And whatever. Since then, its number went down. by like I mean, that's insane. It's like a 50% haircut, no big deal, which is mental. Yeah. And it still looks like it, it, it's not even done. Um, so that, there's my um, mandatory newsletter show. Um, I mean, it, it worked out so well because I still remember us discussing it. We we're like, okay, the market nuked, all coins are bouncing, um, but they all still look like shit. Do we even want to put them in there? Like, yeah, you guys don't realize like we always sit together, talk about this stuff before we kind of decide on what to write about. And then we did like that discussion and we were both like, okay, all coins just look like giant, I mean, just completely garbage. So we don't want to write about it because, I mean, it's just going to get people in bad positions. And I mean, shorting these, I mean, you might as well just wait out the cycle and then just long again whenever they're bullish. So um, we avoided them. And uh, it's been like three weeks now that we've avoided them. And uh, that was basically exactly that retest level. Solana as well, one of the few altcoins we included this as a bearish retest slash a resistance. I think it missed by a tick, but I mean, the idea is there that, hey, this this ain't it, and and, and here we go. Um, yeah. But you know, it's also important to keep perspective. Like, have the fundamentals of any of these, this crypto stuff, like, have they really changed? I mean, some of them arguably have, right? Like the hash rate moving out of China and whatever regulatory crackdown. I expect to actually see more regulatory stuff over the next couple of months and whatever even headed into the new year but like fundamentally we're still kind of trending up right people are building cool stuff there's innovation um we have a new sector of altcoins 
Bitcoin got its whatever tap root and its own Bitcoin country. Like nothing, nothing. There's no like macro or fundamental disaster that happened in crypto. Uh, it's like a timing thing and it's a cycle thing. So just to keep some, may maybe round off the stream with some perspective, I still don't think crypto is going anywhere. So even if we nuke 30k and the market looks like pandemonium, Armageddon, etc., you know, looking into the next year, two, three, five, whatever, uh, those are probably going to be attractive prices as investors over the next whatever number of years. So instead of kicking yourself over not selling the top or doing whatever else, um, focus on what you can do and maybe if it helps to keep a clear mind, uh, have some sense of the higher time frame picture and there will be, you know, wherever there's market cycle inflection points, there's a ton of opportunity. So try to, you know, keep your eyes on the prize in that regard rather mm -hmm. than living in the past. I think that's a decent note to to end on. Yeah, Dark, any, I mean, anything from you on that regard? Yeah, I totally agree with your point there, um, at least for on the Bitcoin front of, of things. Like, I, I think in, in five years, you're probably going to have higher prices. Um, okay. So that's the most bullish thing I've ever heard you say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, that's the thing, right? If you're buying old coins, there might be some that are a shitload higher than they are now. There might be some that are just not there anymore. That's just how these cycles play out. If you're really good at picking the ones that survive, I mean, go hunting because, I mean, they're getting cheap in comparison to like just two weeks ago. They're still pretty expensive in my mind when I look at the, the total market cap. Like, have you scrolled down like through the coin market cap list, like the top twenty in the last few <laughs> yeah. few weeks? Coin gecko, we use coin gecko around. Here. Coin gecko, of course, of course. Um, but like, it's still crazy. But I mean, there's there's probably some gems in in the rough in right. there somewhere. So oh, sure. yeah, don't want to discourage that's a, anyone. That's a good one to to round up on. Um, that's all we've got. Duck, thanks for joining me for Monday. We've got newsletter tomorrow, trletter.com. Um, be sure to check that out. Duck stream on Wednesday. And then we have a podcast episode coming out on Friday. It'll be with everyone's beloved Ledger Status. So that'll be a fun one. And we'll talk to him in a serious, non-up only capacity. So that, you know, be sure to listen to that. Otherwise, like the video if you haven't already. Subscribe to the channel for more cutting edge, cunning, hilarious, entertaining insights. Um... If we nuke 30k and don't reclaim it, I'm now publicly committing to redoing a bunch of my educational videos and updating them and focusing on content output in that regard. So even if the market nukes and goes to zero, there's some some things to look forward to, I guess, because uh, that'll be my trigger to you know b update some of the educational material from from back in the day. So there's always that. Um, Cool, that's it from us. Thank you to Blockfolio for sponsoring Technical Roundup. Still the best way to onboard your beloved friends and family members into crypto. trletter.com, subscribe, like, engagement, algorithms, etc. And we'll see you soon. Duck, thanks again and peace. Peace.